Boeing's Starliner spacecraft is returning to Earth today without its NASA crew on board. Boeing believed in the model that they had created uh, that tried to predict uh, thruster degradation uh, for the rest of the flight. I would say the NASA team looked at the model and saw some limitations. This is video from about an hour ago as the Starliner left the International Space Station. It delivered the crew to the ISS back in June, but after a slew of technical malfunctions along the way, the capsule was deemed too unsafe to bring them home. Those astronauts will stay on the ISS until February. Their mission was supposed to last just over a week. So for more uh, on this, we are now joined by Chris Hatfield. Chris is a retired astronaut, very recognizable to most Canadians. He's also author of a new book called The Defector, and he's joining us from Sarnia. It's good to speak with you, Commander Hatfield. Good to talk to you, sir. How are you tonight? I'm good. I, you know, I it was just considering the fact that you've written this new book and that it is, it's a book of fiction. And then it, I, I wondered, Sometimes it's truth more than fiction. If you consider the, the story here that we're talking about, two astronauts get all the way to the ISS and they are now going to stay there. They were supposed to go for eight days. They're now gonna be there something more like eight months. Um, what do you make of the fact that this has happened? Oh, well, uh, from the astronaut's point of view, that's the best thing that could possibly have happened. It's like the ultimate gift for an astronaut. They thought they were only gonna be there for a week after taking the enormous risk of launch and training for years to only get a week in space is you know, not very fair. So to be extended for a full long duration flight, it's wonderful for the crew. It's a big problem for Boeing that their uh, spaceship didn't work the way they expected. It's got thruster problems and some helium leaks. Uh, but it's on its way home with nobody on board right now. So far, everything's working okay. It's still got a bunch of hurdles to cross, but uh, I think everybody has made all the right decisions here for safety and for productivity on the space station. But there's still uh, some key moments going to happen in the next five hours or so as uh, Starliner tries to land in New Mexico. Yeah, well, let me ask you about those key moments. What are you What are you watching for? Because a lot of eyes are on this too. I mean, there could have been as as astronauts on board. There are not astronauts on board because NASA wasn't willing to take the risk. So, what uh, uh, what needs to happen for this to go right? For the return to, to Earth to go properly? It, NASA was willing to take the risk, but they had a less risky option. You know, by by rotating crews differently and using a more proven vehicle. So, spaceflight is risky. Being a test pilot is risky. But I think the three riskiest things that are still to come with this vehicle. Uh, Number one is the problem that has plagued it, and that's the engines, the little thrusters that allow it to turn and slow down. They're gonna turn it around backwards in a few hours and fire the engine for almost exactly one minute to slow it down enough that it'll start to fall into the atmosphere. And uh, nobody's certain that that's gonna work properly. And then as it comes down across the Pacific um, and starts to slow down in the atmosphere, the heat shield has to work. And then it has three parachutes that have been packed up inside for the better part of a year now, and they all have to work. And then the last piece is just before it touches the ground, it deploys big airbags on the bottom to cushion the impact with the New Mexico desert. So there's still uh, quite a few uh, critical events to happen. But if all of those happen properly, then that's a big leg up towards trusting the vehicle to carry people more operationally up to the space station next time it flies. So you see this, I, that was my next question is, what does all this uncertainty, the fact that this is an unpiloted return of the Starliner, what does that do in terms of uh, future missions? But if all goes well, you think that's going to um, buoy, it's going to instill some confidence? Well, yeah, absolutely. We're learning a huge amount. It's the first time this has ever flown with people on board. So it's nice that we had another choice. Um, but for Canada, it's really important because the next person to fly it is a Canadian fighter pilot, test pilot, a guy from Fort Saskatchewan named Josh Kutrick. And uh, I was emailing back and forth with Josh today. So he's really hoping the vehicle behaves itself because that'll be the vehicle that he will help fly to go do a long duration flight on the space station. So yeah, Canada's got, got some, uh, some dice rolling on the table here as well. But for everybody's sake, I hope the vehicle behaves proves all of the technology and gives 
the world one more way to get people to and from a space station. It's really good to have backup ways to get places. And uh, it's a vulnerability that we had for a lot of years with just the shuttle or just the Soyuz. So uh, it's not easy, but this is like a key hard step today. Um, I want to ask you about those two ast astronauts that uh, were supposed to be on the Starliner. They are not. They are still at the ISS. Sunita Williams and Barry Wilmore, uh, 92 days after the mission took off, uh, they're still up there. And they're going to be up there until they are, I think, brought back by, is it SpaceX is going to bring them back in February? Am I, that, that's what I'm understanding. Um, you, th you said that this is an astronaut's dream to be up there for longer, but um, to what end? I mean, this is some serious travel delay that has happened to them. How, how are they prepared for something like this? Uh, on any of my three space flights, because I went to space stations every time, at the end of it, if someone had said, hey, sorry, you got to stay another month or another three months or something, I, I just would have loved that because it is so hard to get an astronaut to a space station. Once you're there, then you can really do the productive work. But Sonny and Butch uh, have already both flown multiple times. They've both lived on the space station before. I think, in fact, there's a chance one or maybe both of them will be doing spacewalks while they're there, so they're picking up the slack for the crew on board. There's an enormous amount of work to do running the 200-odd experiments up on the space station. So they'll be busy as can be. And they're senior astronauts. This like They've been in the office for over 20 years this will be their last flight. So rather than just a little quick flight, this is a, a real great chance for them to to put all of their training to use, to really be contributory and to, uh, to ride home inside a SpaceX vehicle come next February. So it could have been better if the Boeing had done its job properly, but this is a really nice uh, second choice. You talk about how a uh, successful return of the Starliner, uh, what that will do to you know instill confidence for future missions namely one of them being taken by a, a Canadian on board, which is very interesting, but you know, I, I don't want to predict failure here, but if things don't go well, what's that going to mean for Boeing's relationship with NASA, do you think? Well, uh, I mean, Boeing ha has worked with NASA for 60 years and uh, not everything has gone perfectly. Recently, Boeing has had some really serious management and operational troubles with the airplanes they build and now with this spaceship. They've got to get themselves sorted out. But NASA, they have a whole suite of uh, equipment and crews and vehicles. Uh, the Boeing Starliner is just one of them. NASA needs to take care of the people and take care of the mission uh, as space exploration and, and eventually space settlement. And this is just one piece amongst all of that. So we'll you know, deal with that as each problem raises its head. But for now, uh, everyone just wants to see this vehicle behave itself properly, land tonight uh, out in the desert, and then we can all decide the best path to move forward. When we talk about these kinds of missions, space tourism is almost always the, the second paragraph to the story and how this is leading, um, leading us toward that. But then if there's a failure, I wonder where that conversation goes. What's your hope for the idea of space tourism, the idea that uh, regular individuals will someday be able to, to hop on board uh, a Starliner? If you'd asked the Wright brothers or the very first airplane that flew in Canada, which was Alexander Graham Bell and J.A.D. McCurdy, who flew it in 1909 in Nova Scotia, if you'd asked them about, so what do you think about air tourism? They, they would have scoffed at you because it was so early and it was still so dangerous that you wouldn't have wanted to take passengers or, or unqualified people up. But look what has happened to air travel since then. Uh, there are on the order of 140,000 commercial flights a day uh, now. So, so we have figured out the technology so that that becomes just a part of the human experience. And space travel used to be much, much more dangerous than it is now. We're getting better at it. Um, each vehicle is learning from the previous ones. And it is opening up now that the cost has dropped enough that, uh, that individuals can buy space flights. There are four people in Florida tonight who are waiting until the weather is good enough and they're gonna go up a uh, fly purely privately and do a, a commercial spacewalk on a, inside a SpaceX vehicle, go outside for the very first time. So it, it's a process. I think it's a natural one, just like in, air, in aviation, um, but none of it's perfectly safe. Everything worth doing in life has risk, including exploring the universe.